from the real basics. Um, so what we'll be doing is starting from uh, a multivariate Gaussian distribution, building from there and telling you what this beautiful object uh, called a Gaussian process is. Um, talk about some of the issues to do with Gaussian processes. So these, this is a general purpose tool that we can use in lots of different machine learning problems. We'll talk a lot about regression in a minute, but it can be really deployed across a whole gamut of different, different problems. Uh, think of it as a, a flexible module, a bit like a neural network that you can plug in uh, wherever, wherever you need it. Um, and then uh, in the second half, I'll start building up towards what really is the, the research fringe, a couple of interesting and really important research directions in which Gaussian processes are being pushed in. Um, that's firstly, how do we scale them to big data sets? And uh, secondly, how do you build deep Gaussian processes? Because we, we love deep learning, and so we want to let uh, Gaussian processes do deep learning for us. Okay, so, and I should say, ask questions throughout. It's hard for me to calibrate uh, with your background, so... Uh, if I lose you early on, you should definitely put up your hand and stop the whole thing and ask questions. We've got bags of, bags of time. Okay, great. So let's start off with a really simple motivating machine learning statistics problem. Imagine somebody comes to you with some data points in, in red here, and those data points have inputs, which I'll call x, on the x coordinate, and some measured values associated with those inputs, y. And what we'd like to do is make a prediction what would happen if somebody asked us to make our best guess at what the value of a data point around here would be with this particular input, what would the output be? Okay, so this is nonlinear regression. It involves fitting curves, possibly nonlinear curves, that go close to the data points, maybe not exactly through them, but they've gone exact, exactly through them in this example, and that would allow us to make a prediction at any other unseen x along, along the bottom here. And ideally, what we'd also like to return to the user is not just a best estimate for what the function is doing at any x, but also some error bars around it that says, how, how confident am I in, in, uh, in that estimate? So, you know, for instance, between these two data points, the, the confidence presumably should decrease, the error bars should go up, and around the data, if it's not a very noisy problem, you might be very confident around the, the neighborhood of the actual data that you see. Okay, so this is um, nonlinear regression. Um, uh, with uncertainty estimates being returned to the users. Should we, squidge, should we squidge in people to let the guys on the end sit down, or else they're going to be standing up the whole time? They may want to stand up the whole time, but uh, that's going to be a pain for them. Okay, so that's the basic problem we're going to start with, okay? Um, and what's going to be kind of surprising is I'm going to show you that we can solve this entire problem, nonlinear regression with error bars, with just using a plain old Gaussian distribution. We really need nothing else but uh, a, a Gaussian distribution. Okay, so we need to talk a little bit about what Gaussian distributions are to start with. And I'm going to assume that everyone knows what a multivariate Gaussian is. Okay, um, so if you, have, if you don't know what one is and you have questions after this first bit, that's, that's when you need to ask that question. So here is an example of a two-dimensional Gaussian distribution over variables y1 here and variables y2. And the mean of this Gaussian is zero, okay? And I'm showing you the contours, a couple of contours of constant probability of that, that Gaussian. So y1 here is correlated with y2, hence the, the contours are oriented here. And this is the form, um, the expression for that Gaussian, right, for a multivariate Gaussian. You, it's just the exponential of a quadratic in, that depends on y, which is a, a vector containing y1 and y2, times the inverse of what's called a covariance matrix. Okay? And the covariance matrix contains all the information in this case because the mean is zero. It tells us that this element here tells you what the variance of y1 is, how much one, y1 varies, and it has a variance equal to, to 1. And this element down here tells us that the variance of y2 is equal to 1. And this one in here tells us how correlated the two, the two variables are. So this Gaussian, y1 and y2 have a correlation coefficient of 0.7. And at most, that correlation co coefficient could be 1 if they're exactly equal to one another, or it could, it could be 0 if they're not related to each other at all. So here's one sort of operation we can, can perform with that Gaussian. We could draw some samples. Maybe we can go into... MATLAB or Python, 
and ask it to draw some samples from that particular distribution. There are functions for doing that. And here are one, two, let's say 10 or 15 samples drawn from that plotted in Y1 and Y2 space. You tend to see samples in the regions of high density uh, under the distribution. So you see um, examples sort of along the diagonal here. And now I can sort of visualize what happens as I change the correlation coefficient in my Gaussian, okay, in my two-dimensional Gaussian. So let's go and make things less and less correlated with one another. We're reducing the correlation coefficient down, so now Y1 and Y2 aren't, aren't correlated with one another. And you can see the contours are now become circular because Y1 tells us nothing about Y2, and the, the samples have become less um, uh, concentrated on the diagonal. Let's just play that back. So here things were correlated with one another, and as we move things around, they become less and less correlated. Now they're, not, they're independent. Y1 is now completely independent of Y2. Great. So far, so good. There's one other operation we can do on this Gaussian that's going to be super important, and, and that's called conditioning. So I could condition on the value that Y1 takes a value 1, for instance. Okay? Um, so that means I'm just going to tell you what the value of y1 is, and then I'm going to ask you to predict what the value y2 um, is in this case. And the way you do that is you just take a slice through the Gaussian, and you compute what the form of the density is along that slice. Yeah, this is sort of how to perform conditioning. And one of the remarkable properties of Gaussians is this is now another Gaussian distribution in the variable y2. So if I... Condition on this one, take a slice that has a, a distribution of the same form, e to a quadratic, with a particular mean now and a particular width. So the mean will just be this, this point here, the maximum probable point, the point which cuts the highest uh, probability contour here. And the width just gives you the width along uh, this cut through the, through the Gaussian contours. And in general, it's going to be worth bearing in mind later that this mean depends linearly on the data. It ends up just being a linear transformation of, of y1, um, where this w depends on things to do with the, the covariance of the original, original Gaussian. And there's some, some width, which is also easy to compute using linear algebra. OK. Everyone happy so far? Super clear? Great. OK. And now we can imagine doing a sampling operation, not to the joint density over y1 and y2, but just over y1, uh, over y2, given this particular value of, of y1. Again, we get samples that are relatively near the mean and, and spread out to the sides a little bit, but not too far because the density is quite small. And we can visualize how those samples change as we change the correlation in our Gaussian. So let's move from the correlation of 0.7 again to something which is completely uncorrelated. And now, notice to start with, before we did this, these guys are concentrated in here because y1 is heavily correlated with y2, and so it gives us lots of information about the value of y2. But as we get less and less dependent, the mean moves closer and closer to zero, and it is actually zero now, and the width collapses back to the, to the marginal width of 1. We're, we're maximally uncertain about the value of y2 because y1 tells us no information about y2. Okay, so... That was fairly straightforward. What we now need to do is this visualization works in 2D, and that's the most number of variables that I can talk about, a two-dimensional Gaussian. And I'm going to need some machinery for letting you visualize higher dimensional Gaussians than, than two. And so in order to do that, I'm going to use a nice representation that uh, David Mackay invented, which looks like this. Here's our original representation up here. And here's a sample from it. And here's the covariance matrix. This has a correlation coefficient of 0.9. And I'm going to choose a new way of plotting, plotting that. Along the bottom axis here, uh, we know is the variable y1. And so I'm going to take the y1 component of this sample, and I'm going to plot it um, over this number 1 here. So this number 1 indexes the first dimension of the Gaussian, y1. And I'm going to plot the height here to be the distance along the y1 direction of that sample. Okay, so this height here just means the points location along the x-coordinate of that 2x2 that two two graph. And I'm going to plot the vertical height of the point over the variable index 2. Okay, and the reason why I'm doing this in a minute is I'm going to have multiple variable index, not indices, not just two of them, um, larger numbers. And in this new representation, I can now visualize um, what the sampling operation looks like. 
Okay, so here, here goes. The sample moves around the Gaussian. Um, because the two variables are correlated with one another, the bar tends to move up and down together, but they're not perfectly equal to one another, so the ends, the ends move around a bit. Okay, so the, the bar moves up and down. There's a bit of flexibility because the two variables are not precisely correlated. They just have a correlation coefficient of 0.9. Great, so that was just sampling from the, the joint density over, over y1 and y2. I can also play the conditioning trick. I can tell you that the value of y1 is equal to 1, and then sample over compatible values of, of y2. Um, that's equivalent to sampling from this distribution. And you can see, because these variables are correlated, this wiggles around a bit, but it doesn't wiggle around too much, Okay, because we've, we've sort of learned something about the value that y takes, y2 takes. Okay, so, so, so far straightforward, we've just changed the representation uh, from these 2D plots into this bar-like plot. And now what we're going to do is consider a higher dimensional Gaussian. So here's a Gaussian with five dimensions. Okay, so I'm going to plot the value of dimension one from this Gaussian here, two, three, four, five. And I've constructed a covariance matrix over here for this five-dimensional uh, five Gaussian. So the covariance matrix now is a, a five by five covariance matrix. I'm going to tell you in a minute where these numbers come from. I'm going to give you a recipe for generating covariance matrices. Um, but for the minute, just notice that these are the variances of each one of the variables in each of the dimensions, and they're all equal to, to one. So the variance, which is how much it wiggles in this direction, averaged over lots and lots of samples, is, is just one. And the correlation between, let's say, that first variable and the next variable next to it, y2, this one is quite high. It's 0.9. The correlation with variable 3 is a little bit lower, 4 lower still, and 5 even lower than that. So this point is less correlated with this one than it is with this one, and so on and so forth along. Okay, that's the way I've sort of constructed that heuristically. And similarly for each one of them. So this variable, which is variable three, is really correlated with these two guys, but less correlated with these ones, so on and so forth. Okay, um, so let's see what happens when we sample from this. Um, at the top here, I'm just showing you y1 and y5 plotted together. So it's sort of this correlation coefficient of 0.4. And over here, you can see all the variables moving together. Things tend to move up and down together, but again, there's some, there's some wiggliness due to the fact they're not perfectly correlated. And I can do the same trick as I did before. I can condition on a particular value, let's say of y1, taking the value one, and sample the rest of the Gaussian using the, the formula that I've just shown you. And it looks like this. So notice what's happening here. This guy's moving around a little bit, because as before, it's really correlated with this one. But as the correlations are falling off as we get further away, the whole thing gets more and more wiggly as we, as we go down. Okay, so hopefully we're moving towards an aha moment here. But let's get even bigger. Let's think about a 20 by 20 Gaussian uh, covariance matrix over 20 variables here, y1 through to y20. Um, I can't show you all the numbers in this 20 by 20 covariance matrix now because they're just too small to fit on the slide. So I've converted to color showing you how correlated the variables are. Red means correlation coefficient of one, just bef as before along the diagonal. And then the correlations fall off as the two variables get more and more separated with one another. But under the hood, it's just the same thing as, as before. And I'll tell you, I'll give you the recipe for, for computing this in a minute. Now look what's happening to the samples. The samples look like nice, wiggly, fairly smoothly varying samples from this Gaussian. So here's a random, uh, a bunch of random samples shown to you. You see interesting nonlinear wiggly structure, um, which varies as you, as you move along. And I can play the same trick of fixing some of the values, telling you maybe the values now of the first two variables that take one and maybe 1.3 or something. And I can sample from the rest of them conditioned on those, those two variables. And that's now exploring families of curves which are compatible with those first two uh, values that we've imposed, um, but wiggle around in a, in a way conveyed by our covariance matrix. Okay. So hopefully some of you have gone, ah, this, this is now looking exactly like the nonlinear regression problem we had to start with, right? Because what we've done is someone's told us the value of two of our variables. There was a few more in the, in the first case. We, we were given a whole bunch of uh, pairs of inputs and outputs. 
and then we've come up with a way of generating families of curves which look compatible with those two observed quantities that we, we seem to start with. And maybe if we average over all of these random curves that we've been drawing now, and because things are Gaussian, it's easy to com average over Gaussian variables, we can actually analytically compute the mean of this thing, and it looks like these blue dots in here. The mean here goes up a little bit because these guys are correlated with these ones. As we move far away, they become less and less correlated, so it reverts back to, to zero here. And we can also compute the, the variance and how that depends as we move further along this, this variable index. And the, the variance in here, close to these two points whose value we know is rather small. And you saw that in the curves because these two guys just didn't wiggle around very much because they were correlated with this one. But these things over here wiggled around all over the place. So that meant that when we figured out what the error bar was, the error bar was rather, was rather bigger. And just to make things a bit more concrete, this mean is exactly the mean that I showed you on those first slides that was a linear function of the data. There's a recipe for computing that mean analytically, and similarly, there's a recipe for computing these, these variances, and we'll, we'll come back to it in a minute. We don't need to average over lots of samples. In actual fact, we can just calculate what these things are. Okay, so this is starting to feel a little bit like nonlinear regression, but oh, that's sort of noting that. Um, here's another example, a bit sort of closer to what we saw to start with, where we we can condition on um, non-contiguous index indices here. So here we've conditioned on the value of y12, let's say y7, and y1 and y2, and I've imputed the value of, uh, of functions which go through that, evaluated at these points down here. So it really does start to look a lot like nonlinear regression. Um, but we have an issue, and the issue is it feels like this variable index down here has to be um, equal to the integers, right? In a real regression problem, somebody will come to you with a value of an input that might be an, take a non-integer value. And I, I don't really... What, so one attitude I could take is I could, I could calculate the value of the function at lots and lots of points, which are arbitrarily close to the inputs that the user provides. But that's a bit cumbersome. It might mean we have to sample or evaluate um, this function at lots and lots of different x's. But it turns out we don't have to do that, okay? So... And that's sort of linked to the recipe for where this covariance matrix came from down here. Okay, so here is the recipe for how I generated this thing. And it will resolve this issue to do with having variable index sets down here. So the recipe is this matrix was produced by um, computing this, which is called a covariance function, because it defines the covariance matrix. So this covariance function takes a value sigma squared and multiplies it by e to the minus 1 over 2L squared times a quadratic. Okay, so if x1 is equal to x2, this looks like e to the 0, which is just 1, multiplied by sigma squared. Okay, and the matrix here was formed by taking integers and putting them into here to get the various parts of this matrix. So to get this value, you'd put in x1 is equal to 1 and x2 is equal to 1 to compute this bit. And to get this one, you'd plug in x1 is equal to 1, and x2 is equal to 20 to get this bit, and so on and so forth. Notice, as the variables get further away from each other, this looks like e to the minus of a big number, which is close to 0. And so these things are falling away to 0 as you get further away from one another, becoming less and less correlated. Um, and this is sort of the Gaussian. This is a Gaussian bump. This is, a, this is the form that takes the form of a Gaussian, right? Um, Great, so that's the way you compute K, and then we take K and add uh, an identity matrix scaled by sigma Y squared for reasons that I'll explain in a minute. Okay? And that's the recipe for, for generating this covariance matrix. So notice something neat has happened here, which is, in principle, I could compute this covariance matrix for an arbitrary value of X, which is not an integer. Okay, I, this does not depend on x being an integer. I can plug in a non-integer value of x. And that would correspond to querying this Gaussian at an arbitrary point along this axis down here. It doesn't need to be an integer point. So to begin with, we thought about this integer indexing the dimensions of a Gaussian, like 1 through 20, for instance. And now we've allowed x to be a real value. And so effectively, the Gaussian as defined by this covariance matrix, has an infinite number of dimensions. 
And I can just go in and clear, query which one of those dimensions um, according to a, a real value, which defines where we are on the line. And in the regression context, that's just the input value that, that the, the user comes with you to uh, attach to your data. Um, so this object is called a Gaussian process. We sort of built up now to a Gaussian process. So a, a Gaussian process intuitively is like a big multivariate Gaussian over an uncountably infinite number of variables with an infinite mean vector and an infinite by infinite covariance matrix, sort of roughly how you can think about it. And this is the expression for the covariance matrix in this case. It's called a covariance function rather than a covariance matrix. Um, and what's kind of neat is that actually the sequence of things we've, we've just gone through is um, a non-parametric version of a traditional way of performing nonlinear regression via a parametric model. So let me just explain a little bit more about uh, what that means and how a traditional parametric model uh, relates to the procedure that we've, we've just gone through. So a normal way for performing uh, nonlinear regression that you probably come across in your, in your courses is to say that your outputs as a function of your inputs x equals some function f of your inputs that are parameterized by certain parameters. And then possibly plus some Gaussian noise over here, let's say. Okay, so normally the objective for doing curve fitting would be to figure out what the parameters theta are here that nicely fit all our, all of our data points. That's what we do with linear regression, nonlinear regression, so on and so forth. Um, so it turns out that this is also fitting curves of this form through uh, data points with some noise attached to it, but under the hood, the Gaussian process now has an infinite number of parameters. Okay? Um, and I should point out this is sort of a bit of a, a misnomer. So non-parametric models in statistics are actually models which have infinite numbers of parameters in them. So you shouldn't think of them as not having parameters. You should think of them as having an infinite number of parameters. And the way you have to handle infinite number of parameters is to make sure you, you handle them probabilistically and, and integrate them out properly. And that's what we've done in this Gaussian example. There are effectively an infinite number of parameters corresponding to the all possible locations along this function. Um, but we've only had to compute uh, finite numbers of them. I'll come back to to that in a minute. The final thing I wanted to say about this is um, this noise value in here, sigma y, so this in the parametric model would set how noisy the data are at each point um, and how that, that connects to the underlying function value. Um, that's exactly the same as this parameter in here in the non-parametric model. So this one here is going gonna, is gonna to figure out how noisy your data is and it's something you can learn from data using methods I'll talk about in a minute. Okay, so, um, okay, yes, yeah, so just explaining that. Let's, um, there are some hyperparameters over here. So this covariance function, the, uh, you probably had questions about, well, how do we set this length, there's a, an L parameter in here. How do we set this L parameter? And how do we set this sigma parameter? But it's going to turn out this L parameter, of course, defines how quickly these correlations fall away. So how, how far do I have to go away before things become virtually uncorrelated with one another? And that, in turn, will then set the wiggliness of this function. If, things, if the length scale is very large, then this, these functions are going to be very slowly varying. If the length scale is very small, these functions are going to be very quickly varying. So that's a hyperparameter that we're going to have to learn from data. As I say, I'll talk more about it in a minute. And this thing here will set the typical scale in this direction. Does my function go between 1 and minus 1 typically, or does it go between 100 and minus 100? Um, again, you have to learn this thing from, from data. Great, OK. Uh, is there a clock in here, Mark? Or? OK, great. So I have to look over my shoulder. OK, great. Um, so I didn't want you to go away from this without sort of knowing a bit more formally what a Gaussian process is. So this is sort of the textbook. Um, the textbook definition here, if someone stops you in the street and asks you what a Gaussian process is, uh, there's a big chance of that happening. Um, this, is, this is what you'd say. So intuitively, so the best intuition, I think, is that it's this multivariate Gaussian with an infinitely long vector, a mean vector, an infinitely big covariance matrix, an infinite by infinite covariance matrix. Um, another way of defining it is to say a Gaussian process is a collection of random variables, 
And in general, we're thinking of an uncountably infinite set of random variables, any finite number of which are Gaussian distributed. And the means and the variances of those Gaussians have to agree with all of the other sets. So if we pick a, a set of overlapping variables, the mean of one of those Gaussians has to agree with the mean of the other one of those um, Gaussians and the variances and the, the correlations all have to add up. Okay. Um, just as a, a Gaussian distribution is fully defined by a mean and a covariance, a Gaussian process is similarly specified now by a mean function telling you the mean at any particular point uh, in input space and a covariance which sets the correlation between the, between the different points. And the notation that's generally used is f, which is now a function of x, is drawn from a Gaussian process with a particular mean and a particular covariance. And it's the same as this form where we take a vector f is drawn from a, a multivariate Gaussian with a particular mean and a particular covariance. So it's sort of one to one. To one. Great. Do, do people have questions at this point? Be a great time. Yeah. This is a function. Yeah. This is a function. Yeah. So, so this there's an object lurking in the background. Just as we went through this example to start with, there was a Gaussian process lurking in the background, but it's going to turn out computationally. We never have to deal with all of the infinite variables um, in in the actual computer. We can just represent a small subset of them if you want to do uh, regression or uh, other problems. Um, so we'll talk a bit in a minute how this all works out. How can, how can this infinitely complicated object actually be computable in finite computer time? That's definitely something you might worry about. Let's go to this one first. Yeah. Um, could you Yep. Uh, yep. Okay, so the person's come, to, you've, you've been given data or you've collected data that comprises a finite number of inputs and outputs. That's the red, the red things in here. So the, the inputs which correspond to those outputs are the, are the training data. Um, and then the rest of the function values are just all possible points that you might want to make predictions at. So any particular real valued input that someone might come and, come and deliver to you. And there's obviously an uncountably infinite number of those if you have real valued inputs. Yeah, so, and it's the fact that in general we're not interested in making predictions everywhere up front. We might wait until somebody asks us what the value of the function is here before we actually compute the value of the function is here. That allows us to actually operate on a computer with this. With this thing, yeah. Um, let's do this one over here first. Yeah. Uh, what's the quantifier for x prime? Uh, what do you mean the quantifier? That's uh, x, what is x prime? Uh, x prime. So, so if we wanted to, if we wanted to compute here the um, Gaussian process over a set of variables. So, actually, what distribution does this Gaussian process imply over a, a finite set of variables? We might be interested in that. We might be interested in what's the Gaussian process um, over the function values at the input data. Then um, x just runs over all of the input data to define one half of the covariance matrix, and x prime runs again over the input locations according to the training data. If you see, I mean, it's, the it's the two dimensions of the covariance function. Make sense? So it's actually all possible values of x. Yeah, I should have made that clearer. Yeah, sorry, sorry. There's this parameter in here, sigma y, which sets the variance. And annoyingly, when I made these slides ages ago, I set that equal to, to a small value. That's the same as this value in here. So this is, this is effectively noiseless in this case. But if we crank this up to a value of, let's say, 0.1 or 10, that would mean that the data wouldn't have to lie exactly on the function value. So you, you're completely correct. In general, you can have noisy realizations of the underlying function, and you better not go exactly through those data points. But you'd need a bigger value of sigma y to, to do that. Does that answer your question? Follow up? Yeah. We will come to that. We'll talk a lot, a lot about that in a minute. Yeah, it's a good question. Yeah. 
Ja. Uh, the mean can be anything. It's just a real uh, val a function which takes your inputs and outputs a, a real number between minus infinity and positive infinity. Uh, it can be discontinuous. Yet yeah, there's no constraints on that. This thing has to be uh, positive definite. Um, so when you compute this over a finite number of x's, it has to give you back a, a positive or non-negative definite covariance matrix, a valid covariance matrix. Um, yeah, and um, we'll talk through functions which have that property in a minute, but there's lots. You can go to a textbook and look up you know, a whole dictionary of different covariance functions that would be appropriate for different cases. And I'll, I'll give you a sort of an intuition for, for some sensible choices for some problems in a bit. Any other questions? Great. So you're all completely clued up <laughs> at this point. Um, good. OK. So um, let me just run through one more time what the, uh, the formal uh, argument is for how we're using GPs for regression. So essentially, we're going to follow exactly the same recipe that we do in a parametric model. So remember, in a parametric model, we said our output y of x is equal to an unknown function f of x plus some Gaussian noise in this simple example here. So epsilon is a, a norm 0, 1 Gaussian noise, and I multiply it by the, by the noise variance. So here's a little picture of that probabilistic model. f of x is shown in blue, and the noise that generates the actual data we observed. Um, the error bars are shown in this um, light blue color in here. And sigma y just sets how, how far the data typically will be for the underlying blue curve. And now what we're going to do technically is we're going to place a Gaussian process prior over the nonlinear function. So this nonlinear function in here, we're going to assume has been drawn according to the process which I've introduced you to with a particular covariance matrix, in this case given by this exponential form. And this is possibly a sensible um, way of specifying um, the underlying functions. If you think your data contains smooth, wiggly functions, this will automatically generate lots of smooth, wiggly functions. And we have to figure out what in that space of um, smooth, wiggly functions is going to be compatible with our, our data set. Um, so notice, because the noise is Gaussian in here, and this was a Gaussian process, and because the sum of two Gaussian variables is also a Gaussian variable, so f is, has a Gaussian distribution or a GP distribution, this is a Gaussian distribution, we can integrate out epsilon, and that then defines just an, a Gaussian distribution directly on y, which takes this form, it's Gaussian covariance plus uh, a term along the diagonal which captures the noise. And that's exactly the form that I used to model the data in the last few slides, where this admittedly was quite small. Okay? So it's exactly the same as parametric modeling, except that you put a Gaussian process prior directly on those smooth wiggly functions, and you don't have those pesky parameters hanging around, like the, the weights in a neural network. Okay? You just have these hyperparameters around which set fairly global properties of the function, like over what length scale does it wiggle and how big is the vertical direction of your um, of your function. Yep, question. Yeah, great question. Yeah. So here I've ditched the mean function. This in the prior doesn't have a mean function. So if you believed that your underlying function had a mean of a hundred and it wiggled around a mean of a hundred, you'd want to put in a hundred in here as your mean function. Or if you think your observations were a sinusoid with some random fluctuations around them, you'd want to put in a sinusoid in here. So yeah, you're free to select this, and you might want to learn parameters in there. I just haven't done it in this case. We just assume that mean is zero everywhere. But in a, in a real application, you might not do that. Good. OK. Um, so let's get on to this question about how can we actually do computation with this thing? It's, uh, it has an infinite number of parameters. So how are we going to represent that on a computer? Here we have to remember a really important property of Gaussians which the Gaussian process inherits. And that property is as follows. Let's imagine we have a two-dimensional, um, or a, in general, a, a big multivariate Gaussian over two vector variables, y1 and y2. I can write out that Gaussian distribution in terms of the mean of y1 and the mean of y2, and a partitioned covariance matrix, which tells us the covariance of y1, the covariance of y2, and the cross-covariances. Okay, how much they co-vary with one another. This is like partitioning up 
our two by two example we had to start with and saying the first element of the mean just gives you the mean of the y1 variable and the second element gives you the mean of the y2 variable. You can also do that with, with vectors as well rather than just individual elements. And now let's imagine figuring out what the distribution over just the y1s is. Okay? And that means averaging out all of the y2s. How do, if, if I asked you to compute what's the probability of y1, what what distribution would that be and what would be the mean and what would be the covariance? Does anyone know? The information's on the slide. Yes? Random guess? What's the mean of Y1? A. a, great, yeah. And what's the covariance of Y1? A. Big A, yeah, exactly. You just go and read them off. Okay, great. You worked up the courage to, <laughs> to cry out. Um, so this is great because it means that I can also partition all the bits I care about out here. Maybe it's our training data and a few places that I want to make predictions. And I could put all of the stuff I don't care about here, the infinite set of function values that I don't want to query at the moment, and then only work with this stuff in here using the marginalization property and read off what the mean and the covariance is from the mean function and the covariance function. And I can forget about the infinite stuff that's going on under, under, under the hood. And that means, essentially, another way to say it is, we only need to think about finite dimensional projections of the underlying infinite object on our, on our computer. We can forget about the, the infinite stuff that's going on in the background. Yeah? Great. OK. The third thing I want to say is give you a flavor about how to make predictions, um, because this will motivate uh, a couple of the issues in the second half of the uh, lecture, in particular about how to scale these things to work to large data sets, because one of their Achilles heels of Gaussian processes is they're not that data efficient for reasons that will become apparent. So let's imagine uh, that we've got, again, some observed data, which I'll call Y2, and some points that we want to predict at, a finite number of points Y1, where we'd like to make predictions about what the underlying function is and what the uncertainty is. And again, we've agreed that we can go to our Gaussian process project down onto the data and the places that we want to make predictions at and write down the mean and the covariance of those two, um, those, of those variables, right? This is where we left off the previous slide. And now I can use Bayes' rule to compute what the probability of Y1 is given Y2. This is exactly the same thing as we did on the first couple of slides where we took a 2D Gaussian and I told you what the value of Y1 was and the value of Y2 then followed a Gaussian distribution with a particular mean and a particular covariance. I'm just going to talk through a bit more formally about how to calculate that for multidimensional quantities. So when you do that, you can use um, some uh, basic uh, properties of matrices to compute what the mean of the Gaussian is and what the covariance of the Gaussian is, and they have these, these forms. Okay? This, is, this is something you can go and look up in a, in a textbook. The thing that I want to draw your attention to is that they're involving inverses of matrices, inverses of the covariance matrix here over the data. Okay, so C here is the covariance of the data, Y2, and in order to compute the mean and the error bars on your predictions, the points where you want to make predictions, you have to invert matrices. And that, that costs of order N cubed, okay, where N is the number of data points. The size of this matrix in here is an n by n matrix where n is the number of data. And that's sort of the bottleneck in Gaussian process computation because you're having to invert big matrices which are the size of your, your data set. Let's just look at these, these expressions in a, in a bit more detail. So the prediction at y, at y1 is linearly related to the uh, data points y2. That's again something I, I told you to start with. There's just a linear relationship between the mean at the prediction points and the data you see, and the linear coefficient here depends on properties of the covariance function and the mean, the mean function as well. Um, so linear in the data. Often we said this mean, these mean functions are zero. So if they're a zero, then you get this expression, which is just a linear combination of the, of the data. Uh, the predictive covariance also has a nice uh, interpretation. So A is our uncertainty in Y1 if we've not seen any, da not seen any data so far. So, so the uncertainty in Y1, having observed Y2, is our initial uncertainty in A, minus 
some term which quantifies the reduction in uncertainty from seeing our training data. Okay? So this means that if we've not seen any training data, we have big error bars, and slowly as we see more and more training data, the uncertainty reduces more and more um, and gets you more and more confident, which is kind of what we'd expect and what we've seen from the previous pictures in some sense. Okay, so those are the expressions. I'm not really going to talk much more at this sort of fine implementational level of Gaussian processes. I'm going to stay at the, at the high level. Um, but if you come to work with these things, practically on a day-to-day -day basis, you will be operating uh, with these sorts of terms and trying to come up with stable numerical implementations of things like inverses using Cholesky decompositions and things like that. So under the hood, this is sort of where you'll live, but I won't, I won't revisit this layer much more. Yep. Big B, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Big B is uh, it's back to your question about what's the meaning of x prime. Uh, where do I have it? Uh, so here it would be uh, the training data points as a vector here, the training input points, and the prediction input points as a vector here. That's. It's going to be x1 and x2. Yeah. So it's the covariance between x1 and x2. How correlated are your training data with the points you want to make predictions at? And B, and B the opposite. Exactly. Yeah. Because it must be symmetric. Yep. Great. Good. Okay. So now let's turn to the, the question that was raised down here: Is what what's going on with these hyperparameters? How do they affect the sorts of functions that we get? How can we set them? And and bigger picture: What what's the form of this covariance function that we should be using? So. Here are some samples of our functions using the length scale I showed you in the first examples. And here's the result from doing um, uh, samples when, when you condition. And here's the uncertainty and the, the predictive mean you get out when, uh, when using a, a fairly medium-sized length scale. Here's what happens if you use a short length scale. So remember, our length scale tells you over what range these things are correlated. Let's make the correlations a lot shorter range. You'll see you get much more wiggly functions out. As we, as we sort of intuitively argued. Uh, here's the video of that. And if we condition on data, you see that the family of the curves which go through these points is, is much more wiggly. And when you average out over those curves, you see the correlations fall off much more quickly. So they fall to zero much more quickly uh, away from the data points. Here's what happens if you use a really big length scale, so very long range correlations in your data. If we're going to fit functions through this, everything becomes much more stiff because the functions are much more correlated, as you'd expect. And so the uncertainty estimates you get out, things are much more confident um, uh, because you have more information about the underlying function because the correlations extend much, much further. So these have a big effect on the sorts of extrapolations and the confidence you, you have in your extrapolations and predictions. So we definitely need ways of setting this. If you look at the difference between a short length scale, a medium length scale, and a long length scale, the types of predictions it's making really depend really heavily on these. So we're going to need methods for automatically learning these, these parameters from, from data. Fortunately, that's kind of easy. One method for doing that is to write down the log probability of the data given the hyperparameters theta. So this is the likelihood of the parameters. It's standard maximum likelihood fitting would be one way to go. And just maximize this quantity with respect to the parameters of the covariance function, the length scale in here, and the sort of vertical length scale out here. And because p of y given theta is a multivariate Gaussian, this is available in closed form. I've already told you how to, told you how to compute it. So you then just need to use a gradient optimizer to optimize that cost function. It's dead straightforward. Okay. Um, there are other methods for, for fitting this. Maximum likelihood may not be the best, but there's certainly one easy way of doing it. And there's computer code that you can download that will do this all for you now. Lots of packages in Python and MATLAB, things like that. You can do this thing in higher dimensional spaces, which I want to flag up quickly because we'll need this later. So here's a two-dimensional regression problem where people come, uh, come to you with an input that comprises a first dimension and a second dimension. And here I've extended my uh, Gaussian covariance function to include not just the difference in the x1 coordinate between two points, but also the difference in the x2 coordinate uh, between two points. And this now gives us a way of producing random functions, which depend on not just one input, but two inputs. 
and I can, I can draw a whole sequence of samples again showing you how those things vary over, over the two-dimensional input space. So nothing special about one dimension. Doing higher dimensions is, is kind of easy. Okay, you just need to invent, come up with a covariance matrix which takes all of the inputs as, as arguments here, not just one input but two inputs, and you could do this for, for D dimensions in general. Okay, so that's great. Now let's talk about the form of the covariance function. Okay, so we've, we've always committed to this Gaussian form here. Let's change things. So here's a different covariance function that doesn't depend on the squared difference between two points. It just depends on the absolute difference uh, between two points. And this is a picture of, again, the covariance matrix over a bunch of inputs here. Um, this is uh, going to be um, e to the absolute value between two points. Um, this gives um, functions here where they're actually non-differentiable. They're continuous, but they're non-differentiable. And in fact, this is in, in fact exactly equivalent to Brownian motion, where we specified Brownian motion in terms of its covariance properties rather than using stochastic calculus, as, as some of you might be, be familiar with. So here's a bunch of samples from, from that covariance function. So it looks like a small, a small change. Um, we've only taken the square off here and replaced it with an absolute value, but you get quite different functions generated from this covariance function. And when you average over them, you get straight lines joining your data points which are called Brownian bridges. I don't know if you know this, but if you're using Brownian motion to make predictions, um, you linearly interpolate between two, two data points, which is called a Brownian bridge between the two data points. Um, here's a different form. This is called the rational quadratic. It's also a valid covariance function. It gives you positive definite matrices out. Um, and typical samples look like this. They have slightly different properties from the squared exponential, and it has an extra parameter that controls... <laughs> Uh, various features of the rational quadratic, and when you average over them, you get predictions like this. Here's an even more esoteric one, or interesting one maybe. So this one here is formed by taking a cosine and multiplying the cosine together with one of our favorite Gaussian functions at the top. My laser's running out. Is this going to work? Mm, no is the answer, I think. Okay, never mind. Let's put that over here. Um, yeah, so this one is produced by taking cosine times uh, a Gaussian. And because of the cosine, the covariance function is now periodic. Because the cosine is, is high to start with, where the difference is equal to zero. And then goes down and then comes back up again, where you hit an integer multiple of the cosine, goes down and up again, so on and so forth. And so when you generate functions from this, you get functions with periodic autocorrelation functions. And functions with periodic autocorrelation functions are themselves periodic. Okay? So you get random sinusoids in here with different amplitudes and phases um, that vary over time. And so when you make predictions, you end up predicting and extrapolating according to sinusoids uh, rather than these, these wiggly functions before. So you can fit random sinusoids to points just by taking the uh, appropriate covariance function. Um, so the take-home message from this bit is there are books where you can go and look up appropriate covariance functions for your uh, particular problem, and there are rules for how you can actually compose covariance functions together in a sort of grammar to produce even more complicated covariance functions, like the product of two covariance functions is a valid covariance function, for instance. And that lets you pick a particular one that might be suitable for your problem, um, and they will give you substantially different predictions depending on which form you, you choose. So it's definitely an important, important choice, um, as you can just see from this toy, toy example here. Now, in general, you might not know precisely what type of covariance function you might want to fit to a particular problem. And there are methods for selecting among, amongst which of a bunch of possible models you want to fit. Um, you can do that using Bayesian model comparison in principle. But, and any Bayesian will tell you this is the right thing to do, but this thing involves uh, a really difficult integral over the hyperparameters in your Gaussian process. So in general, um, this is incredibly hard to compute. You need approximations to compute this. And in actual fact, this doesn't work very well at, at all. So if someone tells you that this is a good approach, I would, in general, dis disbelieve them. It's very sensitive to the prior you put on hyperparameters. What, the, the distribution you put over typical length scales. And 
what we'll revisit next half of the talk towards the end is a method using deep Gaussian processes which avoids the need to do this and does automatic kernel design for you. Um, so it'll automatically pick the form of your covariance function in some space that will be appropriate for your, for your problem. We will also talk about in the next uh, half how to handle big data sets. How do we get around this n cubed uh, bottleneck to actually deploying these things because we want to apply these Gaussian processes to think like a million data points or something like that. So I think that's my 50 minutes up for now. Um, we take questions. If there are any more questions, take them for a couple of minutes and then we'll, we'll break. Yep. Yep. Uh, and so there are functions for this. But can it be random? So, for example, if I, if I draw some random sample of, of, of something, so there might be correlation. For yep. example, if I, if I choose, well, it's like a business example, if I choose different funds, which follow different yep. patterns, but, but they are not structured. So, that's, uh, so, and, uh, and so the correlation will be like randomly. Yeah, all of the covariance functions I've shown you so far make assumptions about how the particular functional forms, like you said, about the correlation, like it's a Gaussian bump and it falls away according to some length scale. There are methods for doing richer things than that to, a potential, to put some support over all possible forms of correlation and to learn that automatically from data. So, for instance, you can put a Gaussian process over the covariance over the correlations, essentially, for instance, um, but they're much, they require a lot more uh, computational baggage uh, to do. It's, it would be a hard thing in general. In general, you need to make assumptions to do inferences, and simple assumptions often get you a long way, like, like these ones, I think. Yeah. Yep. The formulation that you showed on the prediction slide, yep. very similar to the similarity. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so a Kalman filter is really a special case of this. So. Um, if you take the probabilistic interpretation of a Kármán filter, you have, um, let's say, x at time t, your hidden state at time t is lambda times x of t minus 1, plus some Gaussian noise, um, and then you make noisy observations of that. Because the hidden state is drawn from a conditionally Gaussian distribution, if you consider the whole joint distribution over the hidden state, that's also a big multivariate Gaussian, and it has a particular covariance structure. And it turns out you can represent that covariance structure in terms of a big covariance function, um, which is called a Gauss Markov a covariance function. And then all of the algebra that you need to do inference is essentially identical to this. But because of this Markov structure that you've built, things are a bit more efficient. So when you actually compute things like the mean and the covariance, you can do things in a sequential forward pass, backward pass way, rather than having to invert a cubic matrix. You get the same answer by using the equations I've shown you. They'd just be much less efficient. But it's a special, a special case. Yeah. Great. One more question, then we'll take things offline. The space of functions, yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, so the first thing to say is, unlike parametric models, the philosophy in non-parametric models is a bit different. It's putting support over all possible functions, um, so, so it would be possible with enough data for the posterior to land on any possible function. So that's not true in a parametric model. In a parametric model, you, you specify some particular functions and you're sort of stuck in that function class, where this is putting some prior probability over any function, which means things are a bit more flexible. That's generally true in parametric modeling. So it's not as sensitive as parametric models to those assumptions. But you're right, it is building in an inductive bias, um, which with small amounts of data will have a large effect on your predictions. So here we only had four data points so the data are, are telling us relatively little about what's going on. We're having to rely on our prior assumptions to, to do most of the work in our extrapolation, and they're having a big effect here. So it depends where you are in that terms of a number of data points to amount of prior, prior information trade-off. But often, you know, you have some domain expertise that, that lets you <laughs> generate quite powerful covariance functions. And if not, there are these methods that I'll, I'll talk about for, for learning that automatically from data. Great, let's break for a bit and we'll do the, the second half in a minute.
my... Uh... Ah, here it is. Mark, you... All right, uh, let's get started again. Uh, great, well, thanks for sticking around. Um, so we've got two big questions in our mind, which I'd say is two of the major frontiers of work on Gaussian processes. One, how are we going to take these things and scale them to big data sets? And two, how are we going to do uh, um, principled learning of the form of the covariance function? Um, the first one we're going to solve... Uh, using sparse approximation methods. And I'm going to give you a, a quick tutorial on, on what that means and basically tell you what the state of the art is in, in sparse appro approximation methods for GPs. And the second uh, problem is going to be solved by using deep Gaussian processes, by taking a Gaussian process and taking the output and passing it through another Gaussian process. Um, and uh, that will be the, the second half of the second half. Okay, so let's talk about scaling Gaussian processes to large data sets to start with. So let's go back to Gaussian process regression. And uh, again, we've got a whole collection of inputs down here that someone's measured and corresponding outputs. And we're trying to make prediction at some point that we've not seen before. Maybe there's a gap in our, our training data set. We want to figure out, well, what's going on in the middle here? And can I give back well-calibrated uncertainty estimates for that, for that region? And we said, one way of doing this is putting a Gaussian process prior under the underlying functions, in this case just saying, I think there's some smooth, wiggly uh, function that underlies that data um, with a particular length scale that we're going to learn from the data um, and some particular horizontal, uh, vertical length scale and maybe some noise. And then we do inference and learning using the equations that we've run through in the first half of the talk. And that gives us a way for returning the distribution over underlying functions, the posterior distribution over underlying functions, and also the likelihood of the, of the parameters, which is the thing that we use to do learning of the parameters if we're going to be maximum likelihood, for instance. Um, OK, there are two sorts of problems that are going to be interested in at once, actually. So the first one is this all costs order n cubed, and if I have a million data points in here, I'd have to invert a million by a million covariance matrix, and that's not going to work. We can do 10,000 by 10,000 at the moment, and that's slowly creeping up, but we can't do a million by a million matrix inversion if there's no special structure to that matrix. So that's a bit of a problem. The second thing is, well, we concentrated on regression in the first half of the talk, but actually a Gaussian process is just a prior over functions, and you can plug that into whatever machine learning problem or statistics problem you like. So you might want to plug that into classification, for instance, or regression with a non-Gaussian noise, or um, unsupervised learning for clustering or dimensionality reduction, for instance. And people have done that. And that introduces analytic intractabilities, so non-Gaussianness. With Gaussians, we can do everything in closed form. But as soon as there's an element of non-Gaussianness, then you can't do the, the math, and you can't compute this posterior, and you can't compute this uh, likelihood function. So we need approximation methods to, to sort of attack both of those things, both computational intractabilities due to large numbers of data points, and analytic intractabilities to do with um, non-Gaussian bits of the model that we want to combine the Gaussian process with. One prevalent idea um, which drives a huge amount of the research into Gaussian processes is based on the following observation. Let's imagine that I just tell you these green data points here, so a subset of the full, let's say, one million data points we started with. If I fit a Gaussian process to that, it'd probably go quite close to the red line in general, um, the original Gaussian process I started with. The uncertainties would be a bit off, but the actual function, if I fit through these green data, would be quite like the actual uh, function I got from the full data set. And maybe if I could adjust the error bars, then that wouldn't be too bad a fit to the, uh, to the actual error bars as well. So sort of based on that very coarse obs observation, um, a huge number of approaches to, to scaling Gaussian processes take the attitude, let's summarize our actual data set using M, which is less than N, pseudo data points, and somehow adapt the pseudo points the pseudo data points, move them around until they best capture 
our actual data that we're, we're trying to explain and, and, and therefore capture the, the um, posterior distribution over functions and the uh, estimate for the, max, uh, the, the model likelihood, the parameter likelihood. Um, great. The sort of the reason this is going to give us computational benefits is we'll then only have to invert matrices associated with the with the pseudo data rather than all of our data. So we end up inverting m by m matrices, not uh, n by n. And if we can hopefully collapse down m, like in this case, it's you know probably ten ti ten times smaller than the true data, then we'll get efficiencies. Yep. Uh, can I ask why you want to take all the data points in the first? Uh uh, in the beginning, because uh, it's a correlation. Yep. Uh, don't we have to just use the uh, points from the left and the right are quite next to our problem? Yeah, that's a great question. So the idea is that the function over here, uh, these guys, the, the data points here, are, are not correlated at all to these ones. The, after several length scales, they're completely uncorrelated. And so maybe I could just locally fit a Gaussian process over here and forget about all the other data. And then for these guys, locally fit a Gaussian process to these data and so on and so forth. And it turns out you can do that. There are lots of methods. Mark, for instance, worked on methods and myself worked on methods which do do something like that. You have to, of course, stitch up what happens at the boundaries. But there are, so to make sure that the fit here agrees with the fit here on the, on the boundaries. Um, it turns out under the hood, this will be doing a similar thing as well, although it's also possible to, to build more of that intuition into the, the approaches that we're, we're going to talk about now. Um, yeah, so it's a, good, it's a good observation. That is, is something that people leverage in other sparse GP approximations. Okay, great. So you're going to have to... This is the first time I'm presenting this stuff in this way, so you should definitely ask questions because this is probably as technical... A technical a thing as I could possibly have chosen to present. So things are going to get a bit heavy for a bit, but we'll come out the other side and we'll be better. We'll be better for it. Okay. So okay. So let me just tell you a brief history lesson of what went on here, because um, this is going to be a question of Back to the Future. It's a bit like neural networks. We're back to the 80s. Well, in Gaussian process approximations, we're back. We're back to the year 2000 or something. It turns out. But um, here's why that's the case. So here's a brief history of what happened on Gaussian process approximations. The first approaches to doing this, or many of the first approaches to doing uh, approximation methods for scaling Gaussian process, took the following attitude. They said, well, we love our Gaussian process, but it doesn't work on these huge data sets. So let's write down an alternative probabilistic model that was inspired by the original Gaussian process model, but which has better scaling properties, and then do exact inference and learning inside that simpler model. Okay, so there's the Gaussian process up here, which is intractable computationally or analytically. Let's write down something that's just easier to handle on a computer, do all of our computations in there that's exact, and hope that because the original model was kind of inspired by the Gaussian process, that the wheels don't fall off. Okay, um, and people combine that idea with uh, this idea of using pseudo data. Uh, prevalent examples of which are, I'll list here. I won't go into details, but the aficionados, which there's some in the audience, this includes uh, these models, and the references are, are below. So one particularly influential approach, um, so this paper has you know, 500 citations or something, um, did the following. They said, let you be our pseudodata. So here are our pseudodata points up here. Let's generate the pseudodata from a Gaussian process, according to a Gaussian process prior. And then imagine that the function values elsewhere, all the gray ones in here, are independent from one another given the green pseudodata. Okay, so they broke all of the direct connections between, between the functions. The correlations in the actual function you're observing just come through correlations in the pseudodata, and you're not affected uh, as you should be by your neighbors. And then you generate the data from this. Um, and this was summarized in a really nice review by uh, Carl Rasmussen and Joaquin um, that sort of came up with a unifying framework which showed how all of these various methods were related to one another. And that's been very influential in the, in the field. But what I'm going to argue is, what I'd like to argue to you is this is a really stupid approach. Like philosophically, philosophically, it's a stupid approach. I mean, one reason why it's a, a silly approach, and this is, this is a sort of a big picture reason, is Imagine you observe 100 data points, 
I don't need to approximate if I've got 100 data points if I'm doing GP regression. I can invert a 100 by 100 matrix. And so um, I can just do exact computation there. But now imagine I see an additional 10,000 data points. Oh, now that's bumping up against what I can do on a computer. So now I need to change my model and introduce some pseudo data and do everything using M pseudo data. And now imagine I see a million additional data points as well. Oh, and now I have to change my model again and have even fewer pseudo data because my, my number of observed data has gone up. And so we're into a game here where we have to change our beliefs about what the underlying function is as a function of how many data points we've seen. And that's sort of against the, the sort of probabilistic modeling philosophy, which is you write down your assumptions about the data, and then you do your computation, possibly with approximations at inference time, but you don't touch what your original assumptions are. In reality, these things are a bit coupled, but it seems like good practice that we should, we should separate out our assumptions about what our data are and the number of data that we observe from that, from that model. So this feels a bit, a bit broken. Okay. So there are approaches, more recent approaches in many cases, which take a different approach, which is to write down the model that we care about, involving a Gaussian process, and then do all of our approximations when it comes to the point that we want to find our posterior distribution and evaluate our likelihood. So they've sort of separated the definition of the model and the approximations that you need to deal with scalability and intractabilities um, coming from non gaussianness And there are a bunch of examples of this. Uh, this is sort of driving a lot of the Gaussian process development at the moment using variational free energy methods. I won't go into it, but it's, a, it's this paper by Michaelis Titsias down here, very influential. Um, and there are these other methods which are, especially this one, which was much more poorly understood. And so we wanted to go in and really understand what was going on in this paper. And um, it was previously known that these two independently developed methods actually were the same thing kind of bizarrely, that you could either think of this as exact inference in an approximate model or approximate inference in an exact model. And surprisingly, what we found was all of these methods could also be interpreted in the same way. I'll explain a bit more about this. So, in fact, apart from these, we had these philosophical issues, but surprisingly, these methods turned out to be reinterpretable in terms of uh, approximate inference in an exact model. Okay? And also... Let us generalize these methods quite substantially. So I'm going to walk you, I'll walk you through that, and this is the reference. I'll put the slide, give the slides to Mark. Okay, does the big picture roughly make sense to start with? Good, some nods. Okay, right, now, now things are going to get tricky. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to tell you about a method for doing sparse approximation based on an algorithm called EP. I believe some of you might have been at a talk where expectation propagation was mentioned. So EP stands for expectation propagation. You might have met it in a message passing context in, in maybe a couple, of, a couple of tutorials ago. But we'll, we'll walk through how it applies uh, in the current context in some detail. So here's our true posterior distribution, the mean shown in red and the error bars around it on our million data points at the bottom here. I can write down the joint distribution over the underlying function and each of our data points by taking the prior from the Gaussian process and multiplying it, applying it together by all of the, the likelihood functions. So this is the prior from the Gaussian process, and this is the bit that might be, might be saying my data are the underlying Gaussian process plus some noise, for instance. Okay? And that noise may or may not be Gaussian. So we can write down the joint distribution like this. There's another way of writing down the joint distribution, which is to factorize it in terms of the marginal likelihood times the posterior. So this is just using the rule that, uh, maybe I could write something up here that would help. This is just using the rule that uh, P of A comma B is equal to P of A given B. It's the product rule, right? P of B. So I can write down the probability of the function value uh, where did I put my pointer? Over here. The probability of the function value and the data is equal to the probability of the data times the probability of the function value given the data. Okay, just this way around. Right, so it's a trivial application of the product rule so far. 
Now, here's what we're going to do. We're going to construct an approximation to this joint density up here. And we're going to construct it in a particular way that it's simultaneously going to give us an approximation for this, which is what we need for approximate maximum likelihood learning of the parameters, and an approximation of our posterior, okay, for free. It's going to do both of those things at once. It will solve both inference and learning for us. And here's how we're going to do that. We're going to define this new object Q star, which is going to approximate P star. And it's going to be, again, formed by taking our Gaussian process prior in here and multiplying it together by a bunch of these Tn's. And these things are going to be little Gaussian distributions um, over pseudodata. So these things are going to be very simple functions. And the idea is that these Tn's are going to approximate each one of these n complicated likelihood functions on the left-hand side. Okay? So we're going to refine these Tn's in a minute to approximate the effect of the likelihood functions. Um, now, this in general will be an unnormalized Gaussian distribution. And I can factorize it in terms of the bit, which is the normalization constant, times a normalized Gaussian process. Because everything's Gaussian up here, this just defines a Gaussian process. And ZEP, the approximation to the normalizing constant, will approximate the marginal likelihood. And Q of F will approximate the posterior. So I'm going to ref by refining these Ts, I will simultaneously get an approximation to the maximum li to the, to the uh, likelihood and an approximation to the, to the posterior in one, in one go. Okay, you're sticking with this. So it's kind of weird. I don't know, maybe you haven't thought about approximate inference too much, but usually when you think about approximate inference, you think about uh, directly approximating the posterior distribution. And this way says, well, there's a better way of thinking about it, which is to approximate the joint distribution using an approximating family. And that will simultaneously give you a method for estimating the likelihood and a method for estimating the, the posterior distribution in one go. Yeah? So have the parameters in your prior? These parameters in here? Theta are the parameters of the prior, is that what you mean? Yeah. yeah. What, what do you mean where the parameters are theta? Yeah, because you mentioned that the Gaussian process didn't have parameters, so it was Oh, sorry, I should say um, these are hyperparameters. Ah, okay. I'm just being loose with my language. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, the hyperparameters of theta. Yep. Yeah, let me just clarify that a minute. So in, in general, I could have let these t's depend on any of the points in the function or, or all of the points in the function. What we're going to let it do is just depend on the u pseudodata locations. So that's the, thanks for pointing that out. That's, that's going to be the key thing that give rise to tractability. So this, this thing over here, depends on n function locations of which the n data lived at, whereas this guy over here is just going to depend on m function locations, and that's going to give us our, our win at compute time. Uh, it's going to turn out. Yep. So at the moment, you're, cor you're correctly identifying, I haven't given you a recipe for how to link the T sub Ns to the data. And in a minute, I'm going to give you a recipe for how to set these things so that they approximate these things. Yeah, so at the, at the end of that algorithm, the Tns will depend on the data. But at the moment, I haven't told you how they're going to depend on the data. Yeah. Great. The setup makes sense, at least. Great. This is we're half the way there, then. Um, so let me give you one general interpretation for this, for this object up here. This object was a prior times a bunch of Gaussians. And one way of thinking about that is, well, it's a prior. If these are all Gaussians, then the product, when I product together a bunch of Gaussians, that also gives me a Gaussian. And so I can reinterpret this thing as the likelihood that comes from some pseudo data points, y tilde, that depend just on the pseudo data u. So, let me do that graphically down here. I can, I can uh, interpret the approximation that we're building over here as constructing a regression data set by moving around the y tildes, some pseudo observations, and moving around the input locations at which I've um, acquired that pseudo data set, such that when I do exact GP regression in that pseudo data set, the posterior here is as close as possible in some sense to the posterior over here. 
So it's kind of a funny way of thinking about inference. Is I'm going to think about a way of doing approximate inference which moves around some pseudo data, the inputs and outputs of a GP regression problem, such that when I do inference on that pseudo data, I get back something which is very close to the true uh, uh, intractable posterior distribution that, that I'm, I'm trying to avoid having to compute. Yeah, so it's sort of think about inference in terms of constructing a pseudo data set in which I do uh, exact inference would give me about the real problem. So this problem over here might be a GP regression problem, or is a GP regression problem. This might be a classification or a non-Gaussian GP regression problem. Great. Okay, so now I need to give you a recipe for moving around the pseudo data. So you just need to get through one more slide, and that will be the technical bit done. And that's how EP works, okay? Um, and this is a, a fairly general presentation of EP. Okay, so here's what we do. We take Q star, and we're going to pick one of our approximate likelihood factors to refine, one of our TNs, and I remove it from Q star. That's a bit like removing one of our pseudo data points. I'm going to take it out. Um, so take out one of our pseudo observation likelihood terms, like removing one of our, our data points out of Q star. And then I'm going to add back in a real data point that would have the tr uh, this likelihood function, the true likelihood function attached to it. So this might be add in a GP classification likelihood function, for instance, or a non-Gaussian noise function. And this is called, uh, this thing up here is called the cavity distribution, when I've removed one of the TNs, because it's a bit like subtracting a data point, and that leaves you a hole in your, in your data set, so it's called a cavity. And when I fill it in with a true data point, that tilts the approximation towards the true posterior, so this has been called the tilted distribution. These are terms from statistical physics where these methods were first, first developed. Okay, the next step is to update your approximation by minimizing a KL divergence between the tilted distribution and Q star of F. Um, let me remind you how the KL divergence is defined. I think you might have talked about this before, but um, so in, in general, uh, the KL divergence between, let's say, an approximation Q of X to a two distribution P of X is equal to the integral Q of X log Q of X over P of X dX. So this is called a divergence between two distributions. Who, who doesn't know? Who, who knows KL divergences? Okay, great. Most of you do know. Great. Okay, so that means I can go a bit more high level. So this thing is greater than or equal to zero, as you guys will probably know. And if we minimize this over, let's say, Q, um, arg min over Q of X, then the result is that Q of X, assuming that P of X is in the support of the family of Q of X, the optimum is to set them equal to one another. And if you set them equal to another, then this becomes log P of X divided by P of X, which is log of one. So this thing takes the value zero when they're equal to one another. And for other points, it's gonna be bigger than zero. So this thing measures, in some sense, the distance between Q of X and P of X. That makes sense? Um, it's called a divergence because it's not symmetric. If I flip the arguments, you don't get the same, same value out. So, but it's a bit like a, a distance between them. Um, there are KL divergences defined for unnormalized distributions as well. So we're going to take the KL divergence between distributions whose integral does not sum to 1. And it's a sort of interesting that there's a... Another, you can add in an extra term here. And now these things are Q stars and P stars. This is now the unnormalized KL divergence between P star and Q star. And if you optimize this thing, it will try and get Q of X close to P of X. And it won't just care about getting the form the same, it'll also try and get the normalization constant the same as well, just by adding this on. Okay. So um, it will match it will match the um, normalizing, it will try and match the normalization constants for both of them. And this is also greater than or equal to zero. 
Okay, so the generalization of the KL divergence uh, that encourages these two things to be close to one another when you optimize it. So we're going to use that measure in here to try and get our approximation Q star to be close to this tilted distribution and spit out a new Q star here. Okay? Mark, yeah, this is a good time to ask questions. So the minimization only happens on T and I assume. Ah, okay, there's some, yeah, there's, that's one way to think about it, but here's the way that we can think about it. So we have to optimize Q star according to, so Q star has to have this form that it's prior times product of likelihood terms. So we update our new Q star, and then we figure out what the TN is just by division. So what I meant is like the, the argument of the KL, the, the thing that is variable in your Q star, if you look at it as a cavity times TN, yep. then it is not the cavity, it is the TN of it. You, you can think of it that way, or you can think of optimizing Q star and then figuring out what TN yeah. satisfies that. Yeah, so you can do it either way around. This is slightly cleaner, I think, actually. Yeah, question? Yeah. Right, so that's what you're saying. So <coughs> N, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So, you know, each corresponding to each data point. Yeah. Okay, so here's where the saving comes from. You might know that if you minimize KL P to Q, in gen and Q is in the exponential family, the way you minimize that is you do moment matching. And it turns out, in this case, you just have to match the moments at the pseudo inputs. So we introduce a new data point. That takes our Gaussian process and converts it into a non-Gaussian process. And then we just have to compute the moments at each of the, of the pseudo data points. And that just involves uh, an m squared operation. And we have to do that for each one of our n TNs, like you said. So we get n m squared. So that's why. It's the magic of this KL projection. You only need the information at the pseudo data. You don't, need the, you don't need to compute the function everywhere. You don't need to compute it where your data are. You just need to compute it where the pseudo data are. And one way you can see that is up here. This was effectively a Gaussian process here. And we multiply it by just one, the effect of one data point at a time. So we have m pseudo data in here. And then we have one real data point. So we only ever have to deal with m plus one data points. We never have to deal with m plus n data points, and so it sort of makes sense that this is what you have to do. Okay, so, so EP is a way of breaking up your problem, so you only have to deal with one of the difficult bits at one time, rather than having to deal with all of the, the product of lots of difficult things. We just deal with one, one difficult thing at one time. It takes a, a long while to get your head around this. It took us two years to get our head around the paper, and then to really convince us the paper which this is based off, and then... Uh, to really understand what's going on. So hopefully the intuitions help. And one thing that might help here is to say that when you perform this update, you can analytically show, no matter what the likelihood function is, that the updates for these TNs is a low rank quantity. They turn out to be a low rank thing, which is again a consequence of these, these things going, uh, going on under the hood. That the consequence of tr treating one data point at a time and only having to match moments at the pseudo data is that the TNs are low rank. So this is going to iteratively construct a low rank approximation to our covariance matrix effectively, and that will help us do efficient inversion. Okay, so it turns out that when you run this algorithm, so this is an iterative algorithm, we have to go round and round again updating all our parameters, you can show analytically that this converges to Fitzy which was really annoying when we came up with it and implemented it, because we thought we were doing something philosophically principled and new, and it had the same fixed points as this well-known approximation that had been around for years. It does exactly the same. The marginal likelihood is the same. The pro approximate posterior is the same. Um, what was even more annoying was, having gone through this, we went back to these two papers, which are two of the hardest papers to understand in the world, and armed with having gone through all the math, we could actually understand them, and yeah, they proved it in 2002. <laughs> so, so this was definitely back to the future. Um, interestingly, this happened, these papers are predate m much of the other sparse approximation methods that are out there. So these guys should be given massive credit for being uh, 10 years ahead of their time, probably, with those papers. Um, this resolves these, in, these philosophical issues with Fitzy, because Fitzy is just approximate inference. It isn't writing down an approximate model and doing exact inference. 
And, and so we are allowed to increase the number of pseudodata as we see more data, and that's philosophically justified now. And it explains why FITSI works so well, because it's actually EP. And we, we already know a lot about when EP works well and when it doesn't work well. So, so it was a nice it sort of tidied this bits of literature up. There's then something really nice you can do, and I'm just going to briefly mention this uh, in the interest of time to get to the deep GP stuff, which is there's a trivial modification to the EP algorithm, which makes everything much more general. And the trivial, trivial modification is instead of removing a whole pseudo data point, you remove just a fraction of it. And instead of including a whole data point, you include just a fraction of it. And then you do exactly the same thing as before. Okay, so it's a bit like adding little bits of your data points in rather than the full effect. And it turns out when you do this, you have a method that blends between EP and variational free energy methods, um, which are very popular for approximate inference at the moment. So in particular, as you take alpha to zero, you can view that as flipping this KL round. This is related to properties of things called alpha divergences, which are generalizations of the KL divergence. There's a whole family of divergences which measures distances between probability distributions called alpha divergences. And they're parameterized by this alpha quantity here. And what that lets you do is blend between variational free energy methods and uh, FITSI methods. And when you take the limit to alpha goes to zero in our case, you get exactly the Tizziat's approximation that we had before. So EP was using the same form of approximation that this variational free energy method that's very widely used at the moment in the literature. It's just the sort of points on the continuum. And there are a couple other generalizations you can make. Uh, so here is varying alpha along this coordinate. Here is grouping collections of data points together, not just treating one data put at a time, but maybe two or maybe three. A little collection of data points. And here's another trick, which is to produce, to, to put the pseudo data in a different domain from the original data. So you don't need to put the pseudo data in the original data space. You can put them in a different data space if you tell, tell the algorithm how that relates to the original space. Um, and it turns out that the field has basically been filling out the corners of these algorithm cubes for the last 10 years or 15 years. So they picked off many of the points on these cubes. There are still a few of them open. If you want to go and publish a paper on Gaussian processes, maybe this one is a good one. This one up here. Um, but this sort of puts everything together in the, in the single unifying framework, which is kind of nice. These are, the, these are the various references. One thing that I always get asked about, which is a really important problem, is how do you set alpha? Um, and the interesting thing is, we tried this for lots of different problems and lots of different random splits for regression and classification. And then we figured out which one of the methods was best for each one of those runs by ranking them. If you look at the average rank here, so one would mean it was always the first plus place method on all data sets and all splits of that data set. And seven or eight means it always, uh, eight means it always came last. You find these plots as a function of alpha. So for instance, let's take classification. The variational free energy, if you're just interested in classification accuracy, variational free energy almost always comes last. EP on average comes about fourth, and somewhere in the middle comes third on average. Um, similarly for log loss, so these are uncertainty sensitive metrics, and these are just interested in prediction quality. Almost always somewhere in the middle does best, and half tends to do surprisingly well overall. Yeah, Mark? But what's the, um, the error measure that you actually used for ranking them? It's just the log loss. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So how well calibrated are your, your, your probabilities, essentially? Yeah. So I mean, I don't have any particular agenda here. It's just kind of curious that somewhere in the middle seems to do better on, on average. It's not true for every data set or every model. It can do, yeah. There can be a really, there can be a strong interaction between the type of the approximation and the high parameter. Uh, this is true. This is all done using squared exponential. That's true. Yeah. So we haven't, um, yeah, we haven't uh, investigated that further. But yeah, I could talk about this at great length. But yeah, there are complicated interactions between the form of the approximation and the and the covariance function as well. Yeah.
Great. Okay, so the, the upshot is we can now scale these things to reasonably large data sets of order of a million or 10 million data points and relatively high uh, input spaces. Um, so this solves some of the scalability and analytic problems. Yeah, okay, we'll take questions now for a couple of minutes. Just a quick question about the application of these models with respect to what it will be using a neural network, for instance. Yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, I'll tell you why you shouldn't use it. Well, I've got, I'll tell you about when you should use the GP and when you should use the neural network in a, in a minute. Um, but um, there's one point of contact between the two, which is that a neural network with an infinite hidden layer is equivalent to a Gaussian process. Um, so you can, if you put Gaussian priors over your weights, and often you use L2 regularization for weights, which would be sort of equivalent to that, and you have an infinite hidden layer, the sorts of functions that that network implements is exactly a Gaussian process if it has an infinite number of hidden, hidden units. So there's a relationship between the two. And I'll talk more about when, when you want to use one versus the other. In general here, the non-parametric thing is still existing under the hood. That's why I wanted to go this approximate inference route. So you still get lots of the benefits of, of the non-parametric model. Things like well-calibrated uncertainty estimates are things you're much more likely to get out of this than a, than a uh, neural network, for instance, because of this. This object that's underneath the hood here. Yep. Could you comment a little bit on the choice of the size of M? So I guess there's two things there is the yeah. statistical estimation or functional approximation, and then the computation as to how it takes M. Yeah, that's a great question. So here, in fact, we averaged over all possible settings of M. We took lots of different settings. So these results sort of give you the average behavior. Um, in general, if you go back to these, the problems I started with to start with here, you get a good intuition for how M, big M needs to be. So count how many wiggles there are in your function. Maybe there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. The effect of each pseudo data point will be local, and it will explain a local wiggle in general. So we'll probably need about ten, maybe a bit more pseudo data points to get all the wiggles in this function. And after we've got ten of them, we won't need any more. We won't improve the... Uh, statistical uh, benefit of adding adding more in, um, so that will that will set the sort of the trade-off point between what's optimal statistically and computationally. So you need as many pseudo data as you have wiggles in your function. Make sense? Yeah. So so that means things which are challenging for current methods are either really long time series like data sets with lots of wiggles in them, or very high dimensional spaces in which the function gets to wiggle in lots of different directions. And that's really where we have trouble getting these sparse approximations to work. Well, the, mil the million data points are just filling out this function with higher and higher density, right? Um, so, and you're still interested in what the uncertainties are as well. Um, so that's, you don't, you probably didn't, you probably, depending on your application, maybe you didn't need to collect any more data, but that's the data set that you've given. And you want the method to automatically figure out that that's the case. Yeah, and remember we can set the number, we can figure out what the number of data point, the number of pseudo data points is by the estimate of the marginal likelihood. So that will tell us when we don't need to add more data points. You can automatically determine that from data. Mark? So from a computational um, perspective, what is like the, a reasonable upper limit for Yeah, it depends, it depends because, um, okay. Uh, if you look at the, the computational complexity, what is n times m N times M squared, yeah. So we're typically using like a order of a thousand for M, um, which I think is what you're after for maybe a million data points, but it, it depends uh, in general. And if the data is very high-dimensional itself? Yeah, so then it's interesting. The, <laughs> there's lots of different cases here because this is a big space, but it can become, the bottleneck can be forming the covariance matrix itself. So actually evaluating the covariance matrix because that, there's where you have to do something related to the number of input dimensions. So if that's your problem, then this is probably not top of your list of what to do. You need to do something to approximate your covariance function evaluation itself. We've assumed here that that was a cheap object to write down in the first place. Great, okay, let's do G GPs.
last bit. You're doing well, sticking with some technical stuff. Uh, okay, DGP is regression. This is going to compare and contrast neural networks to DGPs in some sense, uh, to, to Gaussian processes. So here's what, why we like Gaussian processes. We need well-calibrated predictive uncertainty in general. In general, you're going to be doing a decision-making task. You know, maybe you have an autonomous vehicle and you want to do pedestrian detection, and you need to know, is there a pedestrian there, and how confident I am, am I that there's a pedestrian there in order to decide whether to drive your autonomous vehicle forward. So that's one reason why we need predictive uncertainty, because decision-making requires accurate uncertainty estimates. We'd also like to be probabilistic because, in general, a great philosophy for getting the most statistical information out of a data set is to build a huge probabilistic model that's really rich and powerful, even if you have small data, and let the data decide how much of that big, powerful model it needs to actually use to solve a particular prediction problem. And that's what sort of Bayesian inference does in general. Neural networks, in general, provide terribly calibrated uncertainty estimates. So a ConvNet, as I'm sure lots of you will know if you use a ConvNet or a neural network, it will often output in a classification problem probabilities that are really close to one or really close to, to zero and not very much in between. And you, you've seen these examples with adversarial examples and, and things like that, which sort of show you that neural networks can be overconfident about things which are, are not particularly sensible. So, so Gaussian processes in general are much better calibrated. Uh, the uncertainty estimates. So if that's really what's key in your problem, then you might want to think about using them or using them on top of a neural network. One other reason why we like non-parametric models is if you think of a parametric model, the parameters in that parametric model are a bottleneck between the training data and the test data. You take your parametric model, you train it on some training data, you store those parameters, and at test time, you just use those parameters. You never re revisit your training data, you just use the parameters going forward and predict from them. And so this, the capacity of your parameters sets the capacity of your model to generalize to test data. And the non-parametric models have an infinite dimensional set of parameters in the middle here. And that means they have an infinite capacity in some sense to learn from uh, training data and generalize to test data. So that's another really good reason for being non-parametric. The other route to go is to have an enormous number of parameters, which would be the you know, the deep convolutional neural network type, type approach, but there are problems with that as well. Um, so we have an unbounded model. Effectively, the capacity grows with the training data. Here's where Gaussian processes suck at the moment. So in many mod data modeling instances, there is hierarchical structure in the real world. Think of object recognition as we're using that as a running example. You have objects, they're broken down into parts of objects. Those parts have different textual elements, and maybe at the bottom you have sort of oriented edges which make up the, the visual structure of the world. And so one of the reasons why I think convnets are really good is because they mimic that hierarchical structure. And if you look at the, the units in a convnet, the lower level units detect edges, the middle layer ones sort of detect parts of objects like faces, and the top layer ones detect things like you know, people and so on and so forth. So um, there is this intrinsic hierarchical structure in the real world. We need to build um, methods that can learn that, that are structured um, in that way. And Gaussian processes, as I presented them so far, are just a single layer thing. They're not multi-layer, so they can't learn hierarchical representations. There's also some evidence that perhaps, arguably, it's simpler to learn a set of weak nonlinearities rather than one overall strong nonlinearity in one, in one go, which might be another reason why you want to have uh, deep, deep networks. Okay, so here's how we're going to solve that using uh, Gaussian processes and how that's going to uh, solve our kernel design problem at the same time. So here's just a traditional single layer Gaussian process where we take inputs, we pass them through our function f, we add Gaussian noise to get our outputs. And a typical draw might look something like this. This is exactly what we've been talking about for most of the first part of the tutorial. Here's a deep Gaussian process, a two layer deep Gaussian process, where f, the Gaussian process, is now a function of g, which is a Gaussian process. And that depends on the inputs. Okay? So you take input, you pass it through a Gaussian process, that's the new input to another Gaussian process, and you perform the same thing and go, go off again. So here's an example of why this will do automatic covariance design, uh, kernel design for us. Here's the input down here. Here's a random draw from a Gaussian process G, 
So that maps the input to some intermediate variable that I call z, which is just g of x. And then that goes as the input into this function at the top, which produces f of, f of z. Okay, so this is just a picture of this first mapping down here, and f of g of x is the second mapping at the top here. Now let's try and figure out, when we compose these two things together, what does the combined mapping of x to f of z look like? Okay. So here's what it looks like. Here's f of g of x as a function of x. It looks kind of weird, but notice in this region of the space, we've got some kind of longish length scale. Things are varying kind of slowly. And in this region of space, we've got a really quickly varying length scale. So somehow the composition of these two things has learned a length scale which has changed as a function of the input space. And here's how that happens. Look at the input down here. In this range, all of the x's get mapped to quite a narrow range of possible outputs. And so they get mapped to quite a narrow range of possible inputs here, which then explore a relatively small amount of this function and give you relatively slow wiggles over here. This range here of inputs gets expanded to a much wider range of outputs. So as I move my input around here, it moves through all of these wiggles in the function above. And so things are much more wiggly over here. And similarly at the end here, things are slowing down again, so we get a small length scale. So if we had a method for doing learning and inference in this model, it could learn automatically. One way to think about it is it would learn automatically how to warp our inputs through this function g, such that when I put a Gaussian process on the top, it then allows us to do powerful prediction. So it's going to do automatic learning of this, these warping functions, and that in turn effectively does automatic kernel design for us. Okay, so one other thing is this, as you might have guessed, is equivalent now to a multi-layer perceptron on a neural network with two infinitely wide hidden layers. So it's the infinite generalization, the GP generalization of a multi-layer perceptron um, rather than just a single layer perceptron. GP, single layer perceptron with infinite hidden layer. Deep GP, multi-layer perceptron with infinite hidden layers. Okay. Um, the key is how do you perform inference and learning tractably in this? Um, I, I won't say much about that. I'll get there in a second what I will say about it. And how does this compare to, let's say, neural networks? Well, it turns out that the approximate inference we can do in this model using the infrastructure that I've presented in the first half of this bit, the tutorial. So you can apply EP in this case, or power EP. Um, there's some modifications you need to go, but that's the essence of the approximate inference scheme. The pseudo data take care of the analytic intractabilities as well as the, the, the scaling with the number of data points. Um, how does it compare to neural networks? Well, first off, let's compare it to Gaussian processes. So here's the value function for the mountain car problem. The mountain car problem is you have to drive a car up to a goal state here, and the car gets to choose whether to drive left or to drive right. It doesn't have enough power to make it directly up this hill to start with, so it has to rock backwards and forwards until it has enough oomph to get to the top. And uh, you can compute the value of any state, the expected uh, future reward, under a policy and, how that, and figure out how that depends on the two variables which define the mountain car problem, which is the position and the velocity of the car. Okay. So this is a long way of saying, here's a function that we'd like to model, and one of the properties of the mountain car value function is it has a sharp cliff in the middle, um, I think associated with going off the edge here, I presume, um, off the left-hand side. So if you, if you, in your rocking backwards and forwards, accidentally tip over the right-hand edge... Point where you just get up. Oh, it's point, I see. You don't quite get to the goal state and you fall back okay. down. Yeah. yeah, okay, thanks. So here, for the policy, when we get to this part of the state space, it doesn't quite get to the top and it falls back down and doesn't get the reward. Uh, you get penalized each step for a negative reward as well. So the longer you take to get up to the top, the, the more negative your reward is. So this has a big discontinuity in the middle and is kind of smooth elsewhere. So when you fit a Gaussian process to it, it sort of averages over the whole... Uh, over the whole value function doesn't give you a very good fit because it can't differentially have a short length scale here and a long length scale over here. But when you do the deep GP thing, it learns something reasonable. So learn these discontinuities. So that's sort of, in essence, what's going on under the hood. You can think about this as hierarchical learning or 
efficient covariance design. I'm going to leave you with one figure, because I know I'm getting uh, now close to time, which is to compare deep Gaussian processes with a whole slew of Bayesian neural networks. So these are the ones from um, Kingmer and Welling and DeepMind, Charles Blundell at DeepMind, um, methods uh, that use dropout and variational versions of, of dropout, and methods of Markov chain Monte Carlo that use Langevin sampling, stuff from EY Tay's group, and hybrid Monte Carlo. So Monte Carlo and deterministic inference compared on a whole slew of data sets. So here are a whole bunch of data sets down here. The biggest one has half a million data points and 90 dimensional inputs. I'm only going to give you the summary results here because I'm running uh, short of time. Here are the best Bayesian neural networks which use deterministic inference methods. The best inference method tends to be variational inference, the sorts of um, Kingmer and Welling style inference. Um, performance is on the side here. It's average test log likelihood. Higher is better. Sampling sometimes does better if you can afford to wait for your sampler. These are all HMC runs, but you can't really run sampling very well on these big, big data sets. Um, it doesn't always, do, doesn't always do better, for instance. Um, here's what happens if you use a GP. So Gaussian processes are often better than neural networks on these relatively small data uh, examples and if you evaluate using test log likelihood where you have to have better calibrated uncertainty estimates. So never mind the deep GP thing, Gaussian processes can often be better than, than multi-layer Bayesian neural networks. And here's the deep GPs. So deep GPs often, even on these big data sets, can give you quite significant improvements. Um, so it wins on these three, it loses on these middle ones and wins on these three. And um, we tried this on more data sets now. In general, the, the deep GP is the best method. You can average across all of those to give you the average rank. And it tends to be that the, the Gaussian processes end up doing a lot better than the, than the Bayesian neural networks in general. Great. Let's leave it there and take questions. <laughs> Great. <laughs> So, so we get to ask questions. That uh, um, Mark, should we kick off with you? Yeah, uh, just a quick question about these data sets. Yep. How many of them are classification data sets? These are all regression. I should have said that. Yeah, these ah, are okay. all, all regression data sets. So neural networks are generally worse at regression. Um, GPs are generally worse at classification. Um, we haven't pushed the classification side yet. So you can use the infrastructure to do it, but we just haven't done it. Um, yep. Uh, yes, they do. So you have to initialize all the hyperparameters sensibly. So the, the, one of the keys to this is how to initialize, like neural networks, you have to initialize them properly. So the best thing to do is to set your first few Gaussian processes just to be linear mappings, um, and, then, and then one of them let it be flexible. So the idea is to start with, kick off with what a standard GP would do, and then start to learn the input warping from that point in order to give it extra flexibility. And that, in that way, you'll assume it, you'll hopefully ensure it always does better than a deep GP, uh, than a single GP, and then it starts to get more flexible from there. So you initialize your hyperparameters in such a way that initially you're making sort of linear predictions um, through, the, through the bottom of the network. Uh, yeah, it's never particularly bad. Um, I mean, worse. Worse, yeah, thanks. Yeah, doing the, getting the press. You mean, what's the characteristics? I, yeah, so I, it's hard to know. I mean, these are just standard data sets that we picked out there to do the um, comparison on. I, do, I couldn't tell you what properties of these data sets made deep GPs particularly amenable and, and neural networks not amenable. That would require extra, extra work to do. Yep. Yeah. What? I don't think I understand the question. What do you mean? Do you mean are the inputs like one another? Is that what you mean? Or? If you have several data sets. Yeah. Uh-huh. 
Ooh, that's a good question. Um, do you know Mark? Yeah, I don't, I don't have an idea at the top of my head. We might need to figure out exactly, exactly what you mean. I mean, one way of doing it is to let the hyperparameters be shared between data sets and see are the hyperparameters on this data set similar to the ones on this data set and, do, and build probabilistic models where you either get to share or have independent hyperparameters. But it sort of depends exactly, exactly what, you, what you mean. Do you want the functions to be shared or do you want the hyperparameters to be shared? Yes. Yeah, there might well be kernels that you could invent to, to relate GPs to one another. That's true. Yeah, I don't know of any work that's done that. Yep. Yeah, well, that, that's where the inference comes in. I mean, there would be a risk of overfitting because it's, really, it's now a really flexible function class, but because we're doing principled probabilistic inference, that stops you overfitting. So the dependencies are really that uh, complex? Uh, well, that was not a real date. That was just a sample from a deep GP. But in some of these data sets, you do get very complicated dependencies, and it learns what those dependencies are. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. Okay, so the sizes of the neural networks, the depth and the number of hidden layers, were calibrated to the sizes of the deep GPs such that they both took the same amount of time to train and predict, roughly. So we're, we're picking a compute time and then saying the models have to be of the same size to, to, for that particular compute time. So we, we have done this. I have, I've suppressed it here. If you look at the paper, we've done this for lots of different sizes of neural network and lots of different sizes of number of inducing points. Um, I mean, this is an interesting study just from the, the take home from the, from the neural networks, I think, which is that the stochastic variational inference with the reparameterization trick works really well. Monte Carlo, actually, like HMC, I thought was going to knock the socks off everything, but HMC is not perhaps as good as uh, we thought it was going to be, um, and GPs often do, do kind of well. Dropout is terrible. Um, if you want, want well-calibrated uncertainty estimates, dropout's a terrible thing to do. Uh, EP, which is the probabilistic backpropagation method, this method's terrible as well. So go do stochastic variational inference if you're in G if you're doing Bayesian neural networks. Yep. Could you potentially learn the covariance function itself, ensuring that it remains a valid kernel? Well, this effectively does that, right? Um, in some in some sense, because your overall covariance function k is uh, I can't remember which way around it is. Let's say it's g of x comma g of x prime close brackets. So those warping functions are learning the form of it. So we, I could give you a plot back, which is a distribution over covariance functions, uh, but it's hard to do. Yeah. Are the parameters that you learn in the We haven't looked at it. It could be. If these one-dimensional cases, I imagine it, it definitely will be, but um, in terms of these warping functions. But um, as to the question, is it any more interpretable in a deep neural network? Yeah. I, I doubt it, but... Uh, Yes. Yeah, that's where this initialization trick is key. You need to initialize from a standard GP and then relax from there. And then you can assure at least control for that fact. But it's like a, you know, a, a you know, multi-layer neural network. There's lots of local optima. Um, you have to find a good, well, hopefully a good optima. Great. Well, thank you for your time. And uh, well done for sticking through.